Hello friends, uh, welcome to this show on Desi Plaza TV network, your own media network in Dallas Metroplex and I am your host Kushbu Rolly. Today we are here with an amazing personality of super stature, Mr. Prakash Rao Velgapudi. He has written this book, Reviving Hinduism, which is um, an amazing, amazing book that uh, I think every Hindu must read. Uh, he actually came to U.S. in 1965. He completed his Ph.D. in sociology uh, and he retired in 2006. He has been working uh, in the field of Hinduism and, you know, working towards uh, all the different aspects of Hinduism since last 35 years. He's almost dedicated his life for this cause and this purpose. He is the founding a member of Hindu Temple Society of Mississippi. He has served as president from 1986 to 1991. And during his period, 7,000 square feet Hindu temple was built and consecrated in 1990 with Lord Venkateshwara as Mula Murthy. He is chairman of Datta Yoga Center in, since 1993. He moved to Frisco in May 2009 to help planning and construction of 32,000 square feet Kari Siddhi Hanuman Temple on a 10-acre lot with a budget of about $10 million. And who does not know about that temple? We all here know that temple and uh, we are blessed to have it over here. And who doesn't know this name, Mr. Prakash Rao, who has played a major, major role in actually giving us uh, blessings through the, those temples. He has conducted several tours and lectures on Hinduism, and he is a brand ambassador of Global Hindu Foundation as well. He has written over 125 articles which were published on his website, www.savetemples.org. He has been awarded as Vishwa Hindu uh, uh, by Sri Ganpati Satchidananda Swami. He has been awarded as a spiritual seva leader by NATS. And uh, Swami Vivekananda Excellence Award was bestowed by Yuva Kalwahini and Distinguished Service Award has been given by Tana. And recently on Bharat TV, he was recognized for his service to Hinduism and conferred a Dharma Premika Award in February 2017 in Hyderabad. Well, that was extensive, but I had to say that. And it was a repeat. I know most of you already know all this about him. So let's welcome Mr. Prakash Rao on the show. So, Mr. Prakash, Uncle Ji, I mean, that's how I call you. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I mean, I would like to know how you, do you define Hinduism? What uh, is the essence of Hinduism? You have actually devoted your life. How would you, I would like to know, I think all of our viewers and listeners would like to know your perspective of what Hinduism stands for. That stands yeah, for. We will talk about a few things because it's a very, very <laughs> uh, comprehensive, yes. complex subject. But... Uh, we'll try to highlight few things about our Hinduism. First of all, Hinduism is probably the most scientific religion that you can ever find. So that means what we are saying is Hinduism is the one, all the ancient rishis of Hindus, they have actually developed science over so many years. If you look at zero, infinity, phi, calculus, mathematics, quantum physics, almost anything that you can think of in terms of the mathematics and science, it is Hinduism, our ancient rishis, rishis who developed all these scientific ideas. Yeah, and true. now they have become part of all, even still, even today, those things are still remaining and they are actually promoting the whole world the is reaping the benefits of all those exactly. discoveries and inventions that uh, were done back then in India. Exactly. In the field of so then Vedas and the Upanishads and Puranas, these mm -hmm. are the books that our rishis have written. So they have become the source of inspiration for almost uh, universally. If you look at all the Bhagavad Gita, if you look at Upanishads, almost, major, uh, not almost, majority of the uh, physics Nobel scientists and mathematics Nobel scientists, they always come to Upanishads or the Vedas to find some solution. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't matter how intelligent, how good a scientific scientist is, somewhere along the line they will get stuck. And in order to get the answers, they always come to either Bhagavad Gita or Upanishads. And then they get the answers. They have given credit to these Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita by major, by quite a few number of Nobel laureates. So that's, that's uh, the in terms of the literature. Also, Hinduism is known for 
at least I would say three pillars. One is karma theory, the other one is reincarnation, and the third one is Guru Tattva. In addition to that one, we can also talk about um, the multiplicity of gods, why we have this many gods and all that. That is also uniqueness to our religion. So we can say these are the four unique things. The karma theory, that means whatever you do, so you are going to be okay. either rewarded or punished depending on mm -hmm. how we conduct ourselves. Reincarnation is a new concept, which other religions do not have it, even though at one time, Christianity had re reincarnation concept. It was deleted from the Bible around 243. That's interesting. Yes, it is interesting. <laughs> so even there are some statements even in Bible today, which can really find the examples of reincarnation. So this is one of the most interesting thing. And uh, there are thousands and thousands of cases, not just only in India, but in the United States and Europe, you will be able to find so many reincarnation cases that itself can be a one-hour program, actually. <laughs> and then, so we can also talk about Guru Tattva, which is basic to our, our Hinduism. If you look at the whole history... Guru Tattva is another pillar of our Hinduism. From ancient rishis, actually, they have always dissected, dissected the whole universe they were able to figure out the whole cosmos. And uh, as a result, they are equipped with so much knowledge. Traditionally, most of our children used to go to the gurukulas and they used to learn from these gurus. And so that way this guru concept or the gurukula concept started. All the parents used to send to the gurus so that way they learn all the things. And you see, the, one of the differences between our religion and other religions is this Guru Tattva concept is the one that has reached a, reached a stage where they were able to dissect everything and everything to the extent their intelligence and their comprehension of the universe is unparalleled. If you look at um, other religions, for example, <coughs> you don't have that Guru concept. So as a result, so the knowledge is very limited because when you think of Christianity, it is supposed to be for the shepherds. So that is what the religion started with. They have if, popes and they have like, you know, leaders. Um, yeah. Yes, they have leaders, they, you know, Jesus. In the same way, if you look at Islam, it was supposed to be people who lived in the deserts at that particular time. So whereas in India, the religion developed and then passed on at a very highly intellectual level. So that's the reason we always learn about the science and mathematics and so on and so on, whether it is a medical field, whether it is other fields. In the same way, <clears throat> so we can also talk about yoga and meditation. That is how they were able to excel to the level. Once they sit in one place, they can, they can find out everything about the cosmos. That is amazing and still amazing to me. Yes. I mean, Shivaji, Shivji used to just uh, sit and he just used to know everything. Exactly, it's exactly. Nice. Samad Ramdas, who was his guru also, almost all the gurus, they were able to figure out everything. You know, I'll give you one example of the science, how scientific that one is. <clears throat> in Bhagavata Purana, there is a statement which says, the earth is in existence for 8.64 billion years. So, of course, you know, anybody can say any number, any book can say any number, but how do we know? Can we prove it scientifically? Carl Sagan, who was a geologist, um, you know, who visited India so many times and then he got attracted to it, who also said India is the only one that was, that was able to figure out Earth also is like a human being where it also breathes, it also, it has a birth, it has a death, so on and so on. So he came to the conclusion, along with all the modern geologists, when they studied the existence of Earth, they have come to the conclusion there is not even one year difference between what our Bhagavad Purana was saying about the existence of Earth 
and what the modern scientists have found out. Which is fascinating. In billions of years, not even one year difference. Mm -hmm. So that is how scientific our... our, our even the Grahas and the Kundli system that we have, we knew about more planets and entire solar system back then. And even if we follow those, it still aligns with the planetary position still today. Exactly. Yeah, so, on the solar amazing. system, the, yeah. the solar mm -hmm. eclipse and all those yeah. things that we already knew even before yeah. all so the other religions, the in other two religions came into existence actually. Mm -hmm. So and then another important thing about our religion is Ahimsa concept. Mm -hmm. It is pervaded in every human being you know, on the earth now, but it is the Hindu concept that we always have been peaceful and peace loving, tolerant and then patience. It is because of multiplicity of gods, belief in multiplicity of gods. <coughs> So once you have multiplicity of gods, in terms of the, in terms of the tolerance I'm talking about, in, in, in one family, if you have four members, each member may f believe in one god or the other. It, all four members do not have so to believe in this. So why did this happen in Hinduism? Yes, it brings tolerance and gave the huge, wonderful gift of Ahinsa, and which is, I think, the strength of India and Hindus. Uh, you know, we can live anywhere peacefully and we have that strength in us. But why is this multiplicity of gods to an extent? There's a huge number, and uh, where did yeah. that come from? Okay, you see, it's a very simple logic. Every religion claims that God is omnipotent, omniscient, omniscience. That means He is everywhere, He is in everything, He is knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. Okay, if He is all powerful, if He is everywhere, why can't he take the shape that somebody wants him to take? <laughs> yes. Okay? Because, you see, otherwise what we are saying is, if he says, no, 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 God cannot be in this form, God cannot be in this form, God cannot have this many number of um, mm -hmm. images and all that, that means we as human, humans, with all the frailties, with all the flaws, mm -hmm. we are trying to restrict the God. We are trying to define who God is. Yeah, God cannot have do this, God cannot do this, or he cannot be like this one. Mm -hmm. So that means we are defining the God. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we are saying he is omnipresent and omnipotent. So there is a So everybody can there. have their own uh, exactly. explanation of God and their own version of God. Exactly. And it also boils down to what you believe and what your brain perceives exactly. and where you have faith, on which, again, it aligns with the current scientific processes that whatever you put your focus on and whatever you believe ultimately happens. Exactly. So that means actually along with it, so that tolerance have come from the childhood, we will accept, okay, you know, my daughter believes in this God, that's fine, we accept it. My son believes in this God, we accept. So as a result, that, that tolerance and patience always developed in Hinduism. Whereas in other religions, if you don't believe in my God, you are condemned or you are a sinner, you are something. So our religion is very inclusive religion. We That's always true. make sure everybody has a place in our religion. Mm -hmm. As long as we don't destroy others, as long as we don't criticize other people, as long as we say that he is you know, a sinner, these are some of the things that we find in other religions. So we are fine with us. Mm -hmm. So this is the reason why Hinduism is actually making inroads into the whole humanity all across the globe. I guess, yes, that's the strength. Mark Twain actually went to India around 1895 or so, and he looked at India, and then he said, there is not a single thing under the sun that our rishis have not addressed. Not a single thing. Any topic, you name it, yes. you will find a book on it. But one difference, another difference is, you see, all the major, two major religions have only one book, whereas we have bill, billions, <laughs> bill, I, I think it's the strength, at the same time, that's what makes it hard to follow in current generation, correct, because correct. there's so much to read and so much to follow, correct. so many different variations and, you know, things to know and understand. It's, uh, you know, sometimes to carry it forward to the next generation, it's a lot to do. The, and again, I <laughs> completely respect you for that, for taking that step and actually, yeah. you know, teaching every yeah. Sunday you yeah. have 
Correct. Uh, correct. Some... So, but you see, that's the reason people cannot read so many books. So, as a result, so everybody from Sankaracharya onwards, everybody believes Bhagavad Gita is our central book. That is the essence of all our scriptures. If we can learn Bhagavad Gita, if we follow Bhagavad Gita, if we develop some interest in Bhagavad Gita, start teaching to our children, I think that would be a major uh, milestone in propagating our religion and trying to transfer that information to our next generation. <coughs> you see, also, unlike other religions, we never had a kind of structure where we will be able to teach our children for so many generations. Mm -hmm. Our parents were not taught, our grandparents were not. Ever since our dharma yeah. came into existence, it, has not been, it was not the system where we were able to transmit our information to our next generation. So as a result... We don't have defined school systems also where... Yes. Uh, I mean, in some schools, we have a subject of Sanskrit, but I think it's not promoted the way it should be, uh, where kid can just take a book and read the Sanskrit scriptures on their own. Exactly. So, so now, I think with, uh, with all the um, modern technology, with all the scriptures that you can access mm -hmm. in the internet and all that, I think a lot of people are developing some interest in it. And then especially in Europe, you will see so many people actually uh, flooding the universities to learn Sanskrit yes, and Bhagavad Gita it's and it's all those things. Europe. And uh, in, in, in Germany, you have to wait at least one year mm -hmm. in order to take yes. a course either in Bhagavad Gita or in Sanskrit. So, so why is it considered Deva Bhasha and scientific Bhasha? You see, mentioned like correct. in book here da as well. Da Daiva Bhasha, that's a good question. Sanskrit is our Daiva Bhasha, that is the God's language, we say. Unlike other, other um, languages, this one was not actually developed by a group of people or developed by any one individual. Because when our ancient rishis were meditating, sitting under the trees, and then they keep hearing all these noises and the wind, in the water, and then you know, birds, you name it. All kinds of voices and noises they hear. Based on that one, they were able to look at those voices and try to put them into some kind of a sound. Interesting. And these, you see, all the Inspired alphabets are nature. sounds. That's you true. see, whether it is English, mm -hmm. whether it is Quran, whether it is anything is basically a sound. A is a sound, A is a sound, mm -hmm. except you are giving a form. So that's the reason our ancient rishis have developed this language by listening to the voices and the noises and the, in the nature itself. Same. So that's the reason it is not written by any one person, but it is evolved over a period of time based on the uh, natural habitat. Mm -hmm. And it uh, actually gives a lot of sounds and syllables and uh, um, all the signs which are good for your uh, chakra systems again which entire world is kind of following with those exactly. uh, as you said uh, uh, so many wonderful things about hinduism from guru tattva to the language to all the knowledge in the vedas and of course we have so many names like sushruta who was you know champion of plastic surgery and so many more so it definitely is a guide to live, not just today, but in the future as well. And why not plunge into it to get the essence, what it already has to offer, rather than reinventing the wheel. And anyways, even all the other civilizations are realizing the importance of the hidden knowledge that we have in our scriptures and in our religion. And the beauty being that it's scientific as well as open. It's not asking you to be converted. It's not it's just sharing everything and it respects everybody else and uh, that's what the beauty of Hinduism is and uh, again we are really proud of Mr. Prakash Rao over here who has actually devoted his entire life in promoting Hinduism and uh, taking it forward so that our few, uh, coming generations can actually get benefited from it. We shall be back after a little break from uh, studios of Desi Plaza TV, Kushpur Rawley with Mr. Prakash Rao.